Happy Pi Day, Internet. This is Oscar Release. In this video, we're going to focus on how to compute Pi using machine like formula. I'll go over the history and explain why these approaches work. I'll assume that you have some familiarity with Taylor series. If you need a refresher, check out my video, Origin of Taylor Series. Let's start, as all Pi videos do, with the unit circle, specifically the radian Pi over 4, giving you the point square root of 2 over 2 for the x and y. This means our cosine of pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2, as is our sine. To find our tangent of that angle, we simply take sine over cosine, which in this case would be 1. Therefore, we take the inverse tangent of both sides, known as the arctangent. This means that pi over 4 is equal to the arctangent of 1. Multiply both sides by 4, and we get pi. Now all we need is a way to compute the arctangent. This book should look familiar to those who saw my Taylor series video. Here, James Gregory gives us that Taylor series for the arctangent. And for a lot of this video, I'm going to keep referring to History Pi by Peter Beckman, which is an excellent read that I highly recommend. Beckman writes, Gregory discovered the series for the arctangent in 1671, reporting the discovery in a letter, the one I showed earlier, without derivation. Leibniz found the series for arctangent and a special case for pi in 1674 and published it in 1682 and the series for pi is sometimes called the Leibniz series. I then went looking for that 1682 paper and came across these two references by Horvath and Roy. Horvath cites the original paper, which I then tracked down. It's written in Latin by Leibniz. Looking through it, you can see that series for pi. Roy writes, the discovery of the infinite series for pi was Leibniz's first great achievement. He communicated his result to Hauchens, who congratulated him saying that this remarkable property of the circle will be celebrated among mathematicians forever. Even Isaac Newton praised Leibniz's discovery. In a letter, Newton wrote, Leibniz's method for obtaining convergence series is certainly very elegant, and it would have sufficiently revealed the genius of its author, even if he had written nothing else. Oh, what a difference a few years will make. Roy also describes how Nilakantha and Madhava also figure out this arctangent series. Here is our ninth order Taylor series for the arctangent. Let's see how close it is at 1. Here, there is quite a noticeable gap between our Taylor series at 1 and the actual pi over 4. If we were to multiply this by 4, that gap would only increase. Let's talk about a few strategies we can do to fix this. There are two variables that we can change in a Taylor series. One is the number of terms n. The other is where we center our series. Then in this case, let's change our value for a to be 1. Here, our Taylor series is much more accurate at 1. Let's zoom in. For our function of arctangent centered around the point 1, what would our Taylor series actually look like? Here's our generic form, and let's plug 1 everywhere we have a, giving us this form. Now, let's evaluate that function at 1. We can eliminate these terms since 1 minus 1 is 0. All we're left with is the function at 1, giving us pi over 4. That would mean our Taylor series for figuring out pi uses pi. Let's try another approach. The other variable that we can change is n. Here's what happens when we increase n. If we take our Taylor series and evaluate it at 1 and multiply it by 4, we're still a ways off from pi. In fact, it's going to take a lot of iterations to get us even close. Beckman writes, It is unthinkable that Gregory should have overlooked the obvious case of substituting x equal to 1 in his series. More likely, he did not consider it important because its convergence, a concept also introduced by Gregory, was too slow. Beckman goes on to say, the Gregory Leibniz series was practically useless, for its convergence was so slow that 300 terms were insufficient to obtain even two decimal places. Delany found that to obtain 100 decimal places, the number of necessary terms would be no less than 10 to the 50. Not all hope is lost, though. Recall our point A. The further away we get from A, the less accurate our Taylor series will be. For example, a third is pretty accurate, down to maybe that 12th decimal place. A half is also pretty close, only off in those last three. 
It's only at one where we're very far off. Hold on, do you notice something strange? If you take the arctangent of a third and add it to the arctangent of a half, you get the arctangent of one. Let's try that with our Taylor series. Indeed, adding these two terms gives us a number pretty close to the arctangent of one. Multiplying it by four, and we get a number close to pi. Mind blown. When we're summing arctangent angles, this equation is true. That's because when our sum is between negative pi over two and pi over two, this equation holds. As an example, let's plug in our numerators of one and our denominators of three and two. This means that our arctangent is equal to five over five, also known as the arctangent of one, which is pi over four. For more context, let's turn to how Euler did even more, where the author makes a reference to E705 this paper, where Euler explains how he solved for pi. Notice the reference to Leibniz. There are quite a few arctangent sums in that paper, including a half plus a third giving pi over four, and then multiplying both sides by four to get pi. He also includes a sum for a half and a sum for a third, as well as one for two elevenths, giving finally this equation for pi. Let's dive deeper. Starting with the arctangent of one, we can break that up into a third and a half. The half can be broken up into a seventh and a third. We can break up a third also into a seventh and two elevenths. We still have the third on the right side, which we can break up again. And we can also break up two elevenths into a seventh plus three seventy-ninths. We did the same with our other term. And then if we add up all the leaves, we come up with this summation and combine them to come up with this equation for pi over four. Multiply both sides by four, and we get this equation for pi. Beckman again, using Mach's stratagem in the form Euler's equation and evaluating these two terms, Euler calculated pi to 20 decimal places in one hour. But what's a Mach's stratagem? Recall our arctangent summation. We can rewrite it as, well, a summation. A Mach's like formula is the summation of arctangents for pi such as a third plus a half, or two halves minus a seventh, or Euler's formula. More formally, we can represent it like this. The coefficient c in front is some positive integer, usually four. Our other values for c are positive or negative integers, for example, 20, eight, minus one. They're the coefficients in front of our arctangents. Finally, our fraction, a over b, are some ratio of positive integers less than one. We usually show them that none of these values are zero. The paper John Moshin and Robert Simon on inverse tangent series for pi makes reference to this paper by William Jones, wherein he gives the first hundred decimal digits for pi, as computed by the accurate and ready pen of the truly ingenious Mr. John Moshin. Here's the equation that Moshin used. Longtime fans of this channel will know that I provide a lot of code and documentation to accompany each of these videos. I usually don't talk about the development process, but in this case, it bears mentioning. The first step is to decide on a language. In my case, I require that I needed to change the precision very easily and that it had to have support for rational data types, as well as being pretty speedy, compiled preferably. I ended up settling on CLISP, which has its own built-in pi constant and my arctangent function ended about being eight lines of code long. Then using 333 bits for the mantissa, I was able to gain about hundred decimal digits of pi. It required about 75 terms per arctangent in order to match the built-in pi. This took about 0 0.063 seconds. I then raised the mantissa, which required raising the number of terms in order to get this to match actual pi. What I noticed was that the built-in pi still matched the actual pi. I raised the mantissa and the same thing happened again. It turns out that after looking at the source code for CLISP, their pi constant isn't actually constant. Here's an example of me running my program for 10,000 digits of pi. This took a little over three minutes to run on my old hardware. And if you're curious, the 10,000th digit of pi is eight. When I compared it to the built-in pi, 
that took only over two seconds to run using the Brent Salomon formula, but that's a topic for another video. Here's one final parting quote from Beckman. The digits beyond the first few decimal places are of no practical or scientific value. Four decimal places are sufficient for the design of the finest engines. Ten decimal places would be sufficient to obtain the circumference of the Earth within a fraction of an inch, assuming the Earth was a perfect sphere. Before you click away, I do recommend that you read A History of Pi by Peter Beckman. And recall that pi can be computed using 4 times the arctangent of 1 with Taylor series. That you'll have better precision when you get closer to 0 and when you have a larger value for n. The Moshin like formula is also used to sum those arctangents. And there are many other pi finding methods out there. This is just one of the more commonly used ones, and it works quite well. The example code that I used will be hosted on GitHub. Thank you for watching this special Pi Day themed video. I don't think I'm going to make this an annual thing, but if there are other Pi finding methods that you would like for me to cover, definitely let me know. And again, thank you for watching.